So think about this. Can a mother actually inherit DNA from her child? Can a parent who is a smoker pass down not just their genes to a child, but the risk factors that would activate disease from their smoking? Can they pass that down to their child and then their child and then their child? And then once we have our DNA, once we have our genetics, once we have inherited, quote, whatever it is we're, (laughs) we've got, can we do anything about that? Can we find out what it is? Should we find out what it is? And if we like what we've got, then awesome. But if we don't like what we've got, is there something we can do about it? These are just some of the questions that I explore with today's guest, Carl Zimmer. Carl, is a science writer who has written, I think, 13 or 14 books. His latest is an absolutely fascinating deep dive called She Has Her Mother's Laugh. And it's an unusual, astonishing look at this idea of heredity. Deep dive into what it actually is, the history of it. We spend a lot of time talking about what this actually is and isn't, and all these questions about genetics, DNA, and some pretty amazing cutting edge science that may dramatically affect the answer to the question, do you just get what you get and don't get upset? Or is there something that you can do about your state of DNA and in turn, the future of your life? I'm Jonathan Fields, and this is Good Life Project. Also, before we dive into today's conversation, I have something kind of important to share. Our annual gathering, Camp GLP, is coming up in August. It's just about 90 minutes from New York City. It's already about 80% sold out, and the final $100 early bird discount expires in just a few days at the end of June. So the reason I'm bringing this up is if you've been on the fence or thinking to yourself, this sounds amazing, I have to go, but then figured, ah, I'll come next year instead. We want to make sure that you know there will be no next year. This is your final chance to come and celebrate with us and our beautiful, brilliant community and really just drink in the warmth and the friendship and the profound awakening that this experience brings with it. So to learn more or reserve your spot and come to camp, just visit goodlifeproject.com slash camp or click the link in the show notes. Okay, on to our show. Good Life Project is supported by Intercontinental Hotels and Resorts, presenting their podcast series, Stories of the Intercontinental Life. So with more than 190 properties around the world in iconic destinations like Los Angeles, London, Cartagena, Intercontinental Hotels and Resorts offers endless opportunities to gain new perspectives through travel. And we've stayed actually at Intercontinental Hotels and Resorts a number of times around the world, including an an incredible stay at their location in Bali, where the experience was absolutely breathtaking. I remember we felt like down to the last detail, we were being taken care of like family. And it was also wonderful to see how much of the Balinese culture was integrated into the experience. And now Intercontinental Hotels and Resorts is inviting you to come on a journey of discovery, where they uncover stories that reveal sides to the world that you'd never expect. Ones that will broaden your mind, excite your curiosity, and really stimulate your imagination with stories of the intercontinental life. And you can hear these stories of the intercontinental life at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. When our first child, Charlotte, was due, you know, Grace was, my wife was pregnant, you know, our doctor said, okay, we want you to go see a genetics counselor, which is standard, but we just didn't want to go. We just sort of felt like, well, what, what is there that they're going to tell us, you know, like what, like, you know, and this was way before any, you know, sophisticated genetic testing was possible. This was again, and so this would have been in 2000. And, you know, I go in there just very sort of cocky and a little hostile, I think. And, and the genetics counselors is talking about, you know, the issues of like, well, you know, like we, we, we want to talk about your family and what sort of things you might have inherited and what you might passed down to your child. And obviously like, this is like high school stuff. This is grade school stuff, but it really started to rattle me because this was not an abstraction anymore. Like this was happening, you know, and, and, and she's asking us about our family history. And I'm like, well, you know, there was this uncle who I think had 
this condition, but I'm not sure. And this grandfather who I, I, I can't really remember how he died, but it was something. Oh my God, what was it? Maybe it's something that I could pass down, you know, and she's trying to like sort of calm me down. And, you know, and I so just, you go in at first kind of like all chill, like, you know, it all. And then by, <laughs> I got by this, the time I did this for a living, like, right. you know, just, just, you know, just trust us. We're, we're cool. Yeah. And by the end, I'm just a wreck. <laughs> You know, and then the girls are growing up and, you know, you sort of look at them and you say like, well, she got that from you or no, no, she got that from me or whatever, you know, and it could be anything. It's absurd, you know, and that's kind of where the title comes from. I mean, you say like, well, where'd you get her eyes from? Oh, she's really tall. Where'd she, where'd you get that from? She, she's got your voice. She's got your laugh. You know, she, she, li she likes math. She hates math. Like, you know, like somehow it's as if all these things are sort of magically encoded in 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 some little book that you're passing down to the next generation. And and the, and what's funny is that you know now was a really good time to explore this for among other reasons the fact that you know DNA is no longer this incredibly mysterious molecule. I mean, people just ask each other now very casually, like, you get your DNA tested yet? You know, you do 23, which, which company do you like? Do you like 23andMe? Do you like Ancestry.com? What about Family Tree DNA? Which answers do you like better? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, yeah, exactly, exactly. But, you know, like you're, you know, you're getting, you know, people getting their DNA sequenced, you know, for less than the price of the glasses on my face is just amazing because like the first time people sequenced the human genome was three billion dollars and here we are where you know you can just order it as a cheap christmas present and like you know millions and millions of people are doing it now let me ask you what is the difference between the the quality and the detail of the sequencing that was done the first time that cost three billion dollars and what you would pay a couple hundred bucks for to get from swabbing your cheek now yeah, so so in the 1990s, the, the Human Genome Project, which was a government project, which also kind of turned into a private one as well. There was a bit of competition, but basically the goal was we are going to sequence the quote-unquote human genome, like singular, <laughs> as if we all have the same one. Basically what it meant was we just want one rough map of where all genes are in our DNA. Because our genes are generally all in the same locations on our chromosomes. It's just that, you know, the spelling of our genes might be a little bit different you know, between you and me. So they just wanted one. And it wasn't even like one person. It was actually kind of a mishmash of a few people. I just sort of cobbled it all together. And it was a mess. It was very rough. But it was just like, at least you knew where things were. So, so you, you could say, oh, we, I know that there's a gene at this location. And, and that was huge because all of a sudden people could start studying all sorts of genetic diseases or, or risk factors for cancer and other things without having to hunt through the whole genome to find a gene. You just look at your atlas. So now, if you go to 23andMe or Ancestry.com, they're not sequencing your whole genome. So, so you're... Your DNA, it's spelled out in basically like letters. Like there are like four different units your DNA can be in. And, and you've got like about th over 3 billion letters. So think of like a big wall of books at a bookstore. Like that wall would be your genome. Now, if you go to, if you go to these companies, they will only sequence the letters at a million, about a million different positions scattered through the genome. So it's more like a representative sample. -ish. Yeah, yeah. So these are, yeah. So, and and the thing is that the way that DNA gets passed down, it gets, pa it kind of gets shuffled in each generation through something called meiosis and then passed down. And what that means is that DNA from person to person, they're like similar chunks, you know? So the same chunk of DNA would be sort of like traveling down through the family tree. And so if you know that you have you know, one of these genetic markers at such and such a location and maybe another one nearby, chances are you you can guess what that whole it sequence is. Strange. Yeah, you say, oh, yeah. all right, that that's that's the signature of this kind of chunk of DNA. Yeah. So you, I wouldn't say guess, well, the term is you, the term is impute. You, that's the official term. So you can get a pretty good idea of what your DNA is like from that. And, and you know, it can, you know, if... 
if you needed to like get a super super up close sequencing like you might you know like if 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 there was a gene that popped up as, as being a real concern in a in one of these tests you might go to a clinical geneticist they might say like okay we're going to really sequence that gene like crazy to make sure we know exactly what's going on there now while i was working on the book i actually figured out a way to get my whole my whole genome sequence so which was not easy for you <laughs> no it what well it, it it wasn't so hard to get it sequenced it was hard to get my hands on it so yeah. the actual data once it yeah. on yeah it's the funny thing and, and why and then like why is that a good thing and a bad thing this there was a company that was offering to sequence people's genomes when they went to a meeting to learn about genomes and medicine and this is something they do every year and at that point it was like 2000 bucks so i went to my editor at stat a place where i write about medicine and i said hey if you pay for that i will write you a series of articles i'll just look and see what i got and I'll write about it. And they were like, okay. And so you, so again, we're going from $3 billion to $2,000. Like, that's amazing. And it's cheaper than that now. But anyway, so this company sequences my DNA. And then what they give me, this is a company called Lumina, what they give me is a, is a report. And basically they say, well, we looked for these like 1,600 mutations that we know cause particular diseases. You have none of them. You're a carrier for a couple of diseases, which means that if my wife and I had the same mutation, our kids would have the disease. But these were two diseases that like, if your kid had it, you'd know it. <laughs> so, so that was it. And, and I thought, wow. So no, no access to the huge, huge data set behind that. Right. No access because of the way that they sequence it. Basically, they just... They just break up the DNA into lots of little pieces and they make copies of those pieces and then they sequence those pieces and then they just basically throw all that into a spreadsheet. And so it's like this crazy raw data, which you have to sort of piece together like a puzzle to f try to figure out what the true sequence is. I mean, this is, weirdly enough, this is, is pretty much state of the art right now. There are better techniques that are coming online soon. But so... They would say, well, we don't want to give you this raw data because it hasn't been vetted by a clinical geneticist. It's, you know, you ordered this as a medical test. So we're giving you the results of the test. We're not giving you all this extra stuff. And I was like, no, but I want it. I want it. And, and I, so this, this geneticist who had sort of invited me to this meeting in the first place thought about it when I presented him with this problem. He said, I got an idea. So he was doing a study on what it's like for people to to get their genome sequenced and, and to, to use that to sort of guide their health or just to sort of like incorporate it into their life. And he said, I tell you what, I will enroll you in that study. And then I'll add on a little extra little thing there saying that in your case, you actually get the raw data too. So, so then Illumina said, okay. And, you know, a, a few weeks later, a hard drive shows up at my door and it's got 60 gigabytes of this crazy genetic data. Yeah, but it took forever. And it's it's still very difficult to get your your DNA. If you get if you get a whole your whole genome sequenced, it's just it the procedures really just aren't in place for you to get your hands on it, which is strange to me. I mean, it's your genome. Why shouldn't you have it? But I mean it's interesting too, because they're they're I guess there are, there are concerns, you know, beyond, you know, it hasn't been properly vetted because even when you go to the, the inexpensive commercially available ones, I don't know what the state of the law is around that, but I remember, you know, when they first came out, it's like, oh, a couple hundred bucks, get your genome and everyone's getting it. And they were excited to get all the information. What does this mean? And then pretty quickly after that, they kind of got shut down and said, no, 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 no. You can't be providing any context for this in any way, shape, or form. And then I think it's gotten a bit more lenient. But what's going on there? Why, why does this happen? And what's the concern? The problem there was not so much that the data that 23andMe was providing, it was the interpretation of the data. So they'd say, we're pretty confident that you have this particular variant at this one location in your DNA. And what that tells us is that you have a mutation in this gene 
that's been associated, let's say, with the risk for Alzheimer's. And initially, actually, what they did was they tried to take a few different genes that might be linked to the same disease and try to come up with a sort of their own kind of risk score. So if, you, if we look at all these genes that are associated with this disease that we know of, what would we tell you about your risk? And that kind of information or, or, or claims, I should say, got the FDA really up in arms because they're like, whoa, like th this, is, this is a medical test. And, you, and if you're going to use a medical test, you have to validate it. You have to show us scientifically that, that, that you really are telling people accurate information. And the fact is that, you know, there's a lot of gray zone in the scientific literature when it comes to genetics. It's kind of astonishing. Like, the, I have a variant in a gene that, you know, if I had gotten this stuff done like five or six years ago, my genetics system would have looked at it and said like, okay, like we need to, we need to talk seriously about your incredibly serious heart disease that you have. Because it was a mutation that had been linked in a, in a small study to a, a disease where people just, one day they just dropped dead of a heart attack. It was like that scary kind of heart disease, you know. But then like later, people looked at more and more people and, and, and looked at the data and that, that difference went away. You know, the people with that variant really weren't any more likely to get this disease than they weren't. So at the FDA said like, look, you got to really step up your game if you want to provide this kind of information. So, so 23andMe sort of backed away. They got more into ancestry, telling you like you're, you know, you're 13% Irish or whatever. And, you know, kind of harmless stuff like, oh, you're here. You, these are your genes that we make you, we guess you have blue eyes, you know. And everyone's always like, well, how much Neanderthal are you versus yeah, this versus right. that? Right. They, yeah. they got into the Neanderthal genes and things like that. But now, just recently, they have picked a few diseases and really thrown a lot of resources at it, enough that the FDA has looked at their new application and said, okay, you can you can give people this medical information direct to consumer. So it's 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 happening now. You know, like if you go to 23andMe now, you'll get information potentially on risks for various kinds of cancer or Alzheimer's or all these, you know, really serious things. Then again, what do you what you do with that information still is kind of squishy. Like if you find that you have a like say a 20% elevated risk of let's say skin cancer, you know, I guess you might put on a hat. You know, I you know there 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 might be something things that you might do to sort of be extra careful, but we all should put on sunblock. You know, like it, it, there's a sometimes it could be hard to tell what to do, especially when there's no known way to prevent things or treat them. So if you have an elevated risk of Alzheimer's, what do you do? I mean, there's no there's nothing that we know of that will prevent you from developing it. You know, so. What good is that information? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the the argument would be, you know, there we may not know for sure what, but there are some clear potential interventions, lifestyle based interventions, pharmaceutical interventions, whatever it may be, and maybe it would let you make a decision to say, let me proactively start doing it, even if I don't necessarily know if it's going to be one hundred percent effective. You know, like I accept the potential side effects, or even if there are no side effects, but but it is a really tough question, right? Because it's like, okay, so information that where there's a clear, you know, like here's your risk. And we know that if you make this change in lifestyle or take this, you can have a dramatic effect on your risk profile. You know, that information versus here's your risk of something. We really don't know how to do anything about it. Is is knowing that more damaging than not knowing it? So Robert Green, uh, this geneticist at uh, Harvard who, who I, who had, help me get my genome sequenced. He's actually done a lot of research on the sort of psychological impact of this information. Because one thing that the people said was like, oh, if people find out they have one of these really strong risk factors for Alzheimer's, they're just going to lose it. They're not going to know how to live their lives. It's too much information. And so therefore we should not give that to information to people. Because there are a few variants, like if you got them, your, your chances of Alzheimer's are going to go way up. Most variants, you know, just barely tweak your, your risk. But it turned out that people could handle it. You know, if, if they wanted to know 
whether they had it or not. And then they found out that they, they had it. You know, it was, they were able to, to, to survive psychologically, you know, and move on with their life. But on the other hand, you know, what I find striking is the case with Huntington's disease. So there, it's not a, it's not a question of, do you have a slightly elevated risk of Huntington's or not? Because it's one of these diseases called a Mendelian disease after Gregor Mendel. If you've got one variant in one gene, and you just need one copy of that variant, not two, boom, you are going to get Huntington's disease. And which means that in your 40s or maybe your 50s, you are going to start suffering all sorts of really horrendous brain symptoms. You're going to look as if you're kind of starving and you're, you're going to get dementia and, and you're going to die of this disease. And it's there's n- still virtually nothing that can be done about it. But there's a really, you know, very accurate test for it. And a lot of people with Huntington's in their family, like with parents with Huntington's, don't get the test. They have a 50% chance of getting this disease, but a lot of them don't get tested. Because they don't know about it or they don't want to know? No, they know that there's a test, but they just choose not to know. They're just like, well, like either I've got it or I don't. You know, if I find out when I'm 20, do you, do I want that hanging over my head? You know, there's nothing because there's nothing I can do about it now. So just live either way. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. My, my reaction is it's almost the opposite. It's almost like, you know, like Steve Jobs said, you know, like then knowing that you're going to die is the, the greatest gift while you're alive if you kind of own that and visit it on a regular basis, but if you effectively have something where you know you're not going to be who you are, you know, like at, around a certain time of your life, I almost wonder if that makes you more present and more engaged in the way you live your life and sort of more, you know, like you, you kind of know that you've got a window of time not to waste it. I, I don't know. You know, I, I it's one of those things where I think it's hard for any of us to really fully imagine the experience you'd have to be somebody you know with it in their family and what that means is like you're probably watching a parent dying of it you know and you're probably you're probably like a teenager or young adult yourself and so you get to just see it you know with your fully mature mind and that's just it's hard for me to imagine it So I'm a serious fan of iced tea, but I also really don't dig anything super sweet, which is why I become such a huge giant fan of Honest Tea. I'm actually sitting here drinking a bottle of their honey green tea right now, which I have pretty much every day. Honest Tea does things differently, which is why I kind of love them beyond the flavor. They create real brewed tea, not processed chemicals or powders, and they create delicious tea that tastes amazing with just a touch of sweetness. All the teas are organic and fair trade service. Certified, both the leaves and the sugar, by the way. And they've got tea for the whole family with tea, kids' juice drinks, and sports drinks. And this is something I didn't know. Recently discovered every time Honest purchases fair trade certified ingredients, they actually contribute to a farmer owned community development fund that supports community development projects chosen by the fair trade farmers, which is pretty awesome. So visit honesty.com slash podcast to learn more about Honest and give your whole family something refreshingly honest to enjoy. So I have learned that one of the keys to living a good life is spending time with awesome friends and family. And summer is a pretty great time to make that happen. Even cooler inviting them over to your space and knowing that it kind of really reflects who you are. It feels like home. And that, strangely enough, is often easier said than done, which is where Havenly can really help out. So Havenly is a great way to design pretty much any space in your home on any budget. You start by taking the free Havenly style quiz, and that reveals what really matters to you. We learned, for example, that we kind of love a, a lighter, cleaner vibe, but also with a bit of a homier, more traditional feel. And then Havenly matches you up with the perfect designer to create a beautiful, design based on your unique style and space. And you can buy what you love directly through Havenly too, which is really cool at guaranteed best prices. So we've been working with Havenly on a room in our apartment. It's been really great not to have to go it alone. It's a simple process and great results. And starting at just $79 per room, it's accessible to pretty much everyone. So start by taking the free Havenly style quiz, learn your unique design style and get matched up with the perfect designer just for you. 
turn your Pinterest board into reality. Try Havenly today by visiting havenly.com slash goodlife and get 25% off your design package. That's H-A-V-E-N-L-Y dot com slash goodlife for 25% off your design package. Havenly.com slash goodlife. You know, some people get decide to get this test and some people don't. And when you when you read about their different choices, it's fascinating but grim about, you know, why they choose the way they do. Yeah. And and I guess we're also on the cusp of we're on the cusp of, I guess, maybe starting to leave behind the notion of, well, I got what I got. You know, like <laughs> you get what you get and you don't get upset. When it seems like there's the the next evolution, not even the next evolution, the current evolution of science, the ability to actually alter genes is upon us and is like being very actively researched. And I mean, there's got to be an incredible amount of hope around around this. Oh, absolutely. And so one form of that hope can be treating people for diseases, you know, when they're children or adults, you know, so that let's say someone has, say, sickle cell anemia, which is another one of these inherited disorders where you have two copies of a faulty gene for the hemoglobin in your blood. So there are experiments right now where scientists are what they want to do is they want to introduce viruses into people's bodies and these viruses will infect cells and will insert will basically like rewrite a little piece of of the, their DNA that's faulty so so they'll just rewrite it and that should allow them to be able to start making good hemoglobin that can allow them a, a normal life so, so yeah, so you, I mean, I mean, with it, this is stuff that's actually moving towards clinical trials right now. I mean, it's so amazing and exciting. We don't know if it'll really get the job done yet. I mean, you got to do the experiment, but the, just the mere fact that we're doing the experiment is, is really thrilling. Yeah. And I mean, it seems like it's happening so quickly that it, it sounds like that what you were just talking about is, is that what this thing called CRISPR is that I've been reading about and hearing about for the last couple of years? And, and I, I mean, that just touched down on my radar, at least, really just in the last five years or so. So it's, this is, these ideas, I guess maybe the ideas underlying them have been around for a while, but the actual ability to do this in any sort of meaningful and accurate way is so new. So for you to say that this is actually moving toward clinical trials in the near future, I mean, that sounds staggeringly fast. It is. It absolutely is. I mean, people have talked about the idea of rewriting our DNA for many decades. I mean, once once it became clear that, first of all, genes are the stuff of heredity and that DNA is the stuff of genes and the DNA is kind of like a like a book, you know, that, that you and the 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 write the spelling of the letters in the book determines a, a lot about your health. Then people said like, well, we what if we could rewrite the book? And the imagination goes way ahead of what you can actually do in these situations. But people would try sort of simpler versions of this since the 60s and 70s. So there was something called gene therapy where you would just sort of stick in an extra copy of a gene. Just It would just kind of float around in, in the cell. They said that, and that was the idea. And that kind of, well, there were some promising results, but then things didn't work out very well and someone died in a trial and it kind of stalled for a while. So that was actually in human trials. Yeah, yeah. So there was someone in 1999, I believe, a young man who volunteered to to be treated for this metabolic disease and um, basically his immune system just a, just reacted to the virus and just flipped out and he died of the immune reaction. So gene therapy kind of went quiet for a long time, but now actually it's coming out. They're they're actually getting towards FDA approval too for b- treating blindness and so on. But in the meantime, people were thinking, well, what if would there be a way rather than just sticking in an extra gene? What if you could actually rewrite the the DNA? And the problem was that nobody really knew how to do that. But they were looking at different kinds of gene editing possibilities, and it turned out that bacteria had evolved this technology on their own. It was kind of crazy. It was just sitting there waiting for someone to find it. And, you know, people first sort of found CRISPR in bacteria in the 1980s. And and they were just, 
they're like, what is this? This It was just a very odd kind of stretch of DNA and didn't quite look like regular genes and no one could figure out what it was. And then gradually started to become clear in the 2000s that, oh, wait a minute. So this is a way for for vir- for bacteria to grab DNA from viruses that infect them, insert in their own DNA, and then use that DNA to make little sort of guides to seek out the matching DNA in new viruses that attack them and to bring along an enzyme to cut them, to basically shred the viruses that are trying to make them sick. And so several scientists looked at this, like, for example, Jennifer Doudna at Doudna at Berkeley and Emmanuel Charpentier, who's at Max Planck, and they, they said, okay, now that we kind of understand how bacteria are using this, I think we could use this. We could We could basically, you know, fashion these guides that will take this enzyme to any place we want in DNA. So any stretch we want to find in that huge, you know, wall of books, basically, we can zero in and change it. And they proved that that was true just with scrub loose molecules, and they started doing it in bacteria. Then people started doing it in mammal cells and human cells, and boom, yeah, like really, it was only it was only five years ago when you started hearing about it that all of a sudden this came online and it's moved so fast. that I think the scientists themselves are saying like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> we weren't expecting this. We wanted more time to sort of think about the ramifications of what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, what are those ramifications in terms of, I mean, there's some interesting ethical questions that, that I want to explore, but in terms of the actual risk, because if you have the ability to essentially say, okay, so here's here's a bad SNP that's, you know, like th- here's the SNP for disease or for this or for that. And if we could effectively just swap it out for some good one, that's awesome if it all works. Mm-hmm. Does it always work? And is there a downside risk? So you definitely want to make sure that you cut out the right piece and put in the what you what you want in its place. So, you know, if for some reason that guide ends up dropping in somewhere else and cutting a different gene, you could have serious problems. So there's a lot of work seeking to, there's a lot of work seeking to sort of fine tune this whole CRISPR system so that it's incredibly precise, even more precise than it is now, so that it could be, you wouldn't have to worry about whether it's called off-target effects. And I mean, the other thing that's, that it seems like this is, Yes, it's incredibly complex technology, but at the same time, it seems like this is actually a, a reasonably fast and cheap intervention compared to what a lot of people have tried to do in the past, which if you could create something like this, that could literally swap out the bad for the good. And it was something that was actually potentially doable enough and affordable enough that it was accessible to a mass number of people. I mean, this could change the face of the human condition. It, it really could have incredible impacts, yeah. I mean, that that is another aspect of this, is that CRISPR is cheap. CRISPR is something that grad students use to create, you know, a line of mice, for example, that they want to study as like a model of, a, of Alzheimer's or some other disease. They say, well, okay, if we change this gene in the, in the mice this way, then they'll have these symptoms and we can study it. And just you just it just takes a matter of just a few weeks to do that. And it used to be, oh my gosh, like it it could take a year or more to create one of these lines of mice. And only then would you discover you actually got hit the right target or not. And then you'd have to start over. So yeah, like scientists themselves doing research on animals, plants, bacteria, so on, they're all using uh, CRISPR all the time. And so that that doesn't make you think that wow, like. If we start using it medically, the the impact could be vast. Right. Could be dangerous, but it also could be incredibly beneficial. Yeah. So the phrase you just use is if we start using it medically. And I think that's where everybody's super excited. Yeah, I think one of the ethical questions that comes up with all of this is, well, what if you wanted to use it for a performance edge? What if you wanted to try and target something that would make you taller or more muscular or faster or, or more intelligent or, you know, all these different things that would, in theory, give you some kind of an edge in life, in business, in work, whatever it may be? A, 
is that even possible? And B, talk to me about sort of the ethical conversation around these things. Well, you know, one one thing to bear in mind is that genes do lots of different things. They're involved in lots of different activities in our bodies. So you might look at one particular thing that a gene does and say, ooh, I want more of that, you know? I want bigger muscles, or, or I want more oxygen, or, or I want faster reflexes, or whatever. And if you just have sort of tunnel vision and, and you know, get, get some, somebody to tweak your genes for that particular trait, maybe you get it, but maybe you get a bunch of other things too. You know, so, you know, like you could, you could be putting yourself at risk of a side effect, you know, because that gene might be involved with something else. And now you've affected its performance in that other job in a bad way. So there can be, you know, there, there can be the, these potential extra effects that we, we may just not understand well enough because we just, you know, human biology is still leaves us a lot to understand. I think that sometimes though, that people imagine that for any trait you can think about, there's just one gene in there that if you just toggle it, it'll make you amazing however you want. And again, that's not how human biology really works either. So you mentioned intelligence and, you know, there definitely are genes that, that influence intelligence. Usually what happens is that, you know, if you tinker with, with the, the genes involved in the intelligence, it's a bad thing. Like, you know, human intelligence, you know, some scientists have, have argued is really v- pretty much very well optimized right now among living humans. And so if you start tinkering with it, you're not going to make it better. You, you're probably going to break it. And that just has to do with, you know, how, you know, how neurons sprout connections in the brain, how quickly they send signals and, you know, all these sorts of different things that, that go into what we call intelligence. And the other problem is that, you know, you know, maybe, uh, you know, if you looked at a list of, of genes that are identified as, as having some influence on, on intelligence, you know, if you look at like a gene that, that has, has been found to have any sort of beneficial effect, you might find that it, you know, if you just have one particular variant of it, on average, it raises people's IQ scores like, you know, 0.1 IQ points. So, you know, not a significant effect for the risk, especially. Yeah. yeah, You know, and, and so, you know, like, so, and, and you take, oh, well, just go in there and change a hundred of them at once. Well, we, that is so far beyond today's technology. I mean, at best you can maybe change a few genes, different genes at once. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like these are, you know, on the one hand, these are like definitely conversations that people need to be having. But on the other hand, I'm hoping in the book, I can sort of help people to sort of, to, to recognize which conversations are really pressing and, and really plausible and what are sort of, you know, just more kind of letting our imagination run wild. Yeah, I mean, it is it is so interesting. And, and who knows what the real, you know, like <laughs> who knows with the pace that things are going, what the future will really look like. And the other thing that jumped into my head is that, if we have the ability, you know, if we're rapidly developing the ability to identify genes that cause harm, you know, like SNPs that cause harm, and then pretty inexpensively, you know, like swap them out for good things in a matter of weeks, would it also then be possible to do the opposite, to weaponize DNA, to weaponize these things and use them as tools to cause either individual or mass harm? I, I think that that is certainly something to to think about. You know, we'd have to really like think about scenarios where that could actually be an issue. You know, like how how would that be delivered to people who didn't want to actually go to a clinic and you know have you know viruses injected into their arm? You know, like could you do that? You know, in some sort of airborne bioweapon way. You know, that being said, you know, the U.S. Department of Defense has, has is looking at CRISPR very seriously, like feeling like they need to support research to understand how it works. You know, part of it is that there may be ways to use CRISPR, not just on humans, but on plants, for example. Maybe somehow introducing, if someone could somehow introduce CRISPR into the plants that make up a country's food supply, 
would that be disrupting it? You know, could that lead to famine? You know, could you introduce a, a gene that that makes plants vulnerable to a disease and they all die off or something like that? Like, again, it sounds a little Michael Crichton-y, you know, a little science fiction-y, but it's not as far away from reality. Right. There's like enough of a threat. Yeah. No, I know. And yeah. I mean, I'm writing about stuff right. in, in my book where I'm looking at, I'm like, wow, these scientists are talking about this with a totally straight face. You know, I have one scientist over here saying like, here are these wild fruits. I think I can basically like replay the agricultural revolution in one step and use CRISPR to turn this into a domesticated crop, you know, in one generation. I just need to like put in the right changes and boom, I have a crop, you know, and, and, and I think he's right. You know, <laughs> I, I can, the, the map is right there. The roadmap is right there. Or, you know, other people who are, are introducing CRISPR genes into the DNA of animals themselves, mosquitoes. And this might actually be a really powerful way to, to eliminate malaria in some places by basically cr driving these populations of mosquitoes to become resistant to malaria. Uh, and it, and they're, these mosquitoes are alive right now. You know, they're, they're being very carefully contained in labs, but I've been there, I've seen them. So yeah, when, when, when you're witnessing that stuff, you don't, you tend not to be too dismissive of some of these yeah. Otherwise wild I mean, what, possibilities. What's it like for you to sort of like walk into these labs just on a personal level and know that like you're staring these living things in the face that are the future, that are like nobody else outside of this in the world can see or, or even knows exists? <laughs> it's exciting, especially because not only are these things just in these particular labs and nowhere else, but also these scientists themselves didn't dream that this was possible just a few years ago, you know? I mean, so the, the Anthony James, the scientist who's been raising these mosquitoes in Irvine, he's been looking for ways of genetically manipulating mosquitoes as a way to fight malaria for decades. Mm -hmm. And he's tried all sorts of different things and they just tend not to work. And, and he was, you know, he, he was kind of resigned to the, like, you know, maybe this is just, this was a crazy idea. And then CRISPR comes along and he's like, huh, maybe this would work. And then actually some young grad student down the road in San Diego just was tinkering around and f f figured out a way to make it work. And boom, that was it. They were, they were, they were in business. Uh, and, you know, it's it, like the fact that they're almost sort of stumbling into this kind of stuff is astonishing. Yeah, it really is amazing. The which also brings up interesting privacy concerns, right? I mean, if we're freaked out these days by what social media platforms know about us that we're giving them voluntarily, like if 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 sequencing our genome, if sort of having having more detailed levels of information becomes really readily available to all of us, does it just become you know, you go to for your end of your physical or whatever it is the first time you're, you know, like you're, you're an adult and part of the, you know, the physical test for that year, it's, you're not just getting your normal blood, you're getting your genome. And then that becomes a part of your medical history that then follows you for life. It's like, you know, it's really interesting questions about not only do you want to know it, but who else do you want to know or not know? And then for people like, or industries like insurance, you know, where they're in the business of trying to evaluate your likelihood of getting X, Y, and Z, and then adjusting what you're going to pay for the rest of your life based on that. I mean, the ramifications are huge. They, they are. I mean, in, in a way, you know, life insurance companies and, and health insurance companies have been doing kind of a rough version of this just by looking at family history. Family history is a pretty good guide to some some of the dangerous genes you may have in your life. But again, it was it's just ru a rough idea. Yeah, now potentially an insurance company could look at your entire genome. Now, fortunately, in the United States, we have this law called GINA, which basic it's the acronym for it. Basically, it it prevents insurance companies from using genetic information to sort of determine whether you can get insurance or not, health insurance. 
no, not life insurance, not long-term insurance. They can, if they can get their hands on it, it's okay. I think that, that, you know, the, these, all these health systems are, are sequencing the DNA of their patients. Like some of them are saying like, we're just going to just grab everybody's genomes, partly because it's great for research. You get a huge data set. Huge data set. And then you can start to, you can start to see things about basic human biology you could not see before. Because if you have like, you know, like 23andMe is actually getting into this business, you know, so they just, they have, you know, uh, 5 million customers. And so they'll have like hundreds of thousands of people who like have a hard time sleeping and, and thousands of people who don't. And they just, when you have that many people and you have their DNA, whoosh, all of a sudden, like you see dozens and dozens and dozens of genes that are linked to these conditions that no one had seen before. So that's really exciting. But that's, and that's going to be really potentially very useful for medicine. It's not going to be able to happen if everybody's terrified that their DNA is going to be used against them. That's not something that's sort of essential to DNA itself. It's more a question of like, what kind of healthcare system do we want Mm. or that we're going to just put up with? You know, we're putting up with a, a healthcare system that's really dysfunctional in a lot of ways. And one of them is that, you know, we, we are potentially going to deprive ourselves of all this insight that's going to come from our own DNA because people are going to be so scared they're going to go bankrupt. Yeah. Well, I guess, and I guess, you know, the laws will have to start to keep pace <laughs> with the science, which is nice, an, another issue. You know, we see the same issue in technology, right? You know, like we're having the same issue now in medicine. You know, zooming the lens out more, the idea, you know, we've been kind of granularly focused on DNA and modifying it, um, but just the bigger idea of heredity is. It's kind of fascinating to me because reading through your work, it's what I learned in high school was very cut and dry. <laughs> and that's, you know, admittedly, it's pretty much where my education ended and in, in anything beyond just popular reading around it. And, you know, like the, the notion, what you really offer is that this is not only far more nuanced, it's far dirtier, it's far, far more complicated, it's far less clear. And I mean, even the idea that at one point you, you, you talk about the idea that, that a mom can actually, DNA can pass both ways when, it, when in utero, which kind of is, is a little bit mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can have heredity in reverse basically. So when women get pregnant now, they're, they're, the fetus is, is shedding cells and those cells can get into her bloodstream. And after the baby is born, in a lot of cases, the, those cells disappear. In some, a remarkable number don't disappear. And these fetal cells will end up potentially all over a woman's body. So there was one study where scientists did autopsies on women who had died. These were women who had sons. They looked in particular at their brain and they could find neurons in there with Y chromosomes. So these were clearly their son's cells that it integrated themselves into their brain, these women's brains for life. Um, they had become neurons and the cells had been found in other parts of the body, in, in, in various organs and breast tissue, just all over the place. And so these, these women are called chimeras after the mythical beast. And that's not the only way that you can become a chimera. So there are, Sometimes, you know, there will be twins in the womb and one of those twins just fails to develop and kind of gets absorbed into the other fetus. And then a baby is born and no one's any the wiser that there was a twin, except that that person's body is now a combination of the, of these two kinds of cells. And there have been these crazy situations where people, you know, get genetically tested and they don't seem to match themselves. <laughs> so one of the wildest examples was a, was a woman who had to get a genetic test as part of claiming welfare benefits because she was a mother and she had these kids she was taken care of and she needed, she needed assistance. And they said, well, these aren't your children. She's like, well, what? what? Of, of course they're my children. And then they just started accusing her of fraud, and and she was actually pregnant at the time. And there, there was a, a, you know, someone the government sent somebody to basically watch her give birth, 
And then they did another test on this new baby and they said, no, that's not yours either. <laughs> because these, a these eggs were being produced by one population of cells inside of her and the blood they were drawing was coming from the other population. You know, they were basically looking at the two twins inside this one woman and saying, well, it's not the same. It's just incredible. And, and this is not that rare. It used to be when it, this was first discovered, people thought, oh, well, this is like one in a billion. Uh, it's quite common. I mean, you could be a chimera for all I know. Mm. Who knows? Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how complex it is and how the pathways go both directions. And one of the other things that, that I think is really fascinating is the idea that there may, there's a hereditary relationship, not just with the genes themselves, but the the epigenetic state of those genes, like what 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 is turned on and what is turned off, and that a decision or an action that a person takes during their lifetime to drink a lot, to exercise, to not exercise, to be exposed to certain chemicals that may influence their genes or the expression of their genes, that not only the gene itself, that not only the code can get passed on, but the state, whether it's expressed or not, that can be passed on too. Yeah, I mean, it's it, kind of freaky. <laughs> it, it is. It is. It really it raises a really profound possibility that that experience can alter heredity. That and and you know this this has echoes to this old idea that Lamarck and others would put forth that you know the inheritance of acquired characters and and you know for a long time people said that well that could never happen. You know, that's impossible. But you know that was that came out of a time when we would just think of we were just totally focused on genes as sort of the defining element of heredity, and you know in my book I sort of argue that you know we we ought not to to just put our blinders on too tightly you know because there are you know heredity doesn't have to equal genes you know there can be other channels that heredity can use possibly, and when one cell divides in two, you know both of those new daughter cells inherit the same DNA because it copies the DNA, but it also copies all these, they also have all these molecules around the DNA that determine what is used and what isn't. So that's its own kind of in, kind of inheritance. And so, you know, it, that could really play a big part in our health. You know, if you smoke, as you mentioned, like does that affect the epigenetics? in some sort of long-term way. So that when cells divide, you know, are, are, you, are they inheriting some kind of dysfunctional kind of state? And then the big question is, well, does that go from one generation to the next? That's, that's the million-dollar question. Yeah, and that's so what did, gets people really crazy. Right, so it's you know, like three generations ago, if a grandparent was a smoker, is that affecting you now? And then what, you know, if you make a decision now, is that potentially going to affect, you know, the genetic expression of your great 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 grandkids or something like that? It's a really mind blowing idea, yeah. and and you know, I mean, people have really grabbed onto it. There's lots of really really strong evidence for that, but it's in plants. <laughs> so if you're a plant, yeah, that that can actually be a very important part of heredity, definitely. Now, you know, people are more interested in themselves than they are in plants. So, you know, they want to know, well, what about me? Well, things get sketchier because, partly because these experiments are just hard to do. But there's, you know, these tiny little worms that scientists study called C. elegans, and, and they seem to have something like this too. Like you can give them some experience and it will alter their, their eggs and sperm, and then they sort of will pass down something different through several generations. You can see the mark of experience several generations down. When you get to mice, then people really start to debate fiercely about whether these experiments are legitimate or not. There's some amazing experiments. You know, there's one experiment where scientists would expose mice to a certain smell, you know, a certain almondy kind of smell, and then bzz, they get a shock. And then those mice had offspring and and they they actually did this to male mice so the only thing that they could pass down would just be their sperm and the contents inside of it dna and the other molecules and they claimed that in the following generation those mice if you expose them to this odor they were unusually like reactive startled, to yeah. yeah 
But, you know, if you bring that up in a, in a group of researchers in this area, some of them will love it and some of them will just scream about it. It's, it's really at that sort of, you know, intense moment right now. So we'll see where it goes. Yeah, it is really cool that there's work being done around it and, and that there's actually a, a debate about it now rather than just like completely that's ludicrous. Which also kind of brings us to the one more thing I really want to talk to you about, which is this idea of microbiome. You know, so th this has been another huge buzzword, microbiota, microbiome, gut biome for, you know, like a while now. And I think most people have heard it. Most people probably know, have some understanding of, well, we've got all these critters living in our gut, you know, and, and, you know, and there's a lot of them <laughs> and that they, and now, you know, there's research that's showing that sort of the makeup of what those critters is can dramatically affect not just our state of well-being, but our disease risk, our state of mind, like the, our thought patterns, yeah. which is freaky. And talk to me about how the idea of heredity and DNA within the context of, of those things comes into this conversation. So th this is a really fascinating area because if you look at certain species, there's it's really hard to tell the difference between their own genes that they inherit from their parents and the bacteria that they inherit from their parents it's everything's so intimately wound up so take cockroaches so so cockroaches actually have special organs where they grow a certain kind of bacteria just one species of bacteria and that bacteria can't live outside it can only live inside cockroaches. And there it breaks down some of their food and provides them with some essential nutrients they need to survive. So if you get rid of these bacteria, the cockroaches die. Now, in female cockroaches, something amazing happens, that the cells that contain these bacteria will crawl over to the cockroaches' eggs and they'll sort of glue themselves to the eggs and then split open and then the bacteria infect the eggs so that the when these these eggs are fertilized and then and they develop and then they the cockroach lays them the bacteria are already inside the cells in, in in the cockroach larva they're already there from the very beginning and you know these bacteria have these genes that let them do something essential for the cockroach's life so you really say like well we're you know, like what's the difference? Like they, they are inheriting these bacteria just the same as they are inheriting their own genes. There are lots of examples like this in the animal kingdom. It's fascinating. And so that raises a question, well, what about us? You know, like where we all have the micro, this microbiome. Right. And we need it for our survival. We, also. we need it. Has it. To be there. It's, it, it does all sorts of things for us. It tutors our immune system when we're young, you know? So if you don't have a healthy microbiome, you may develop certain kinds of immune disorders. You need them to synthesize vitamins, all sorts of stuff. We don't have, you know, bacteria kind of like infecting our, our cells, you know, when, when we're like a, you know, a, a fertilized egg. It's not like that. But, you know, what's interesting is that there's a lot of debate about, well, when, when does the human microbiome get started in a baby? It used to be thought that, that babies were totally sterile when they were born. Not the case. They, you know, certainly by the time they're going through the birth canal, they are getting slathered with <laughs> bacteria. And so that basically you are getting exposed to these certain species as you're being born, maybe even earlier. And in breastfeeding, they're actually bacteria in breast milk because they, they grow in the breast. Certain species grow in the breast. They get into the breast milk and it looks as if they thrive in a baby's gut. Mm. And, you know, women actually will produce a certain kind of sugar that the babies can't digest, but certain kinds of bacteria can. So it's almost like they're producing the food for those bacteria to yeah. flourish. Huh. They're, they're, yeah. So they're, they're, they are feeding certain kinds of bacteria. Now it's true that like, you know, we pick up lots of bacteria just in a you know day to day existence. So you wouldn't really say that, you know, you inherit bacteria that you got when you like handled a doorknob or someone passed you, you know, a piece of cheese or something. <laughs> but there seems to be sort of an underlying kind of heredity, you know, like there are certain kinds of bacteria that seem to be special to our species that that have been adapting to us for millions of years. And so 
there there is there's this to to some extent we may be in, inheriting our microbiome. It's a, it's a fascinating area, right? I just and especially if if as the research seems to be pointing to the fact that there are there are healthier microbiota and and less healthy ones and ones that you know as people are trying to alter theirs you know on a daily basis now by taking prebiotics and probiotics and eating different foods to try and get different health outcomes you know and again it goes back to that earlier conversation which is when we think about not just the actual genetic code that we have gets potentially passed on but you know the the state of our bodies surrounding them, which we may play some active role in creating, in some way, like you wouldn't, like you said, you wouldn't necessarily say that gets inherited, but if it kind of all happens <laughs> at the same time, and that that becomes, you know, the fundamental bacteria that implant, you know, a colony that then populates the inside of, you know, offspring's body, effectively, it's pretty close. <laughs> Well, I, I agree because I think that, you know, it would be good to kind of reclaim the word heredity and to think about it more broadly than just saying, well, it's just these particular genes that you inherited and that that is everything there is to know. I, I think that heredity is more about, you know, what previous generations are handing down to this generation and what this generation is handing down to future ones, you know what what accounts for our similarities. You know, our microbiome is a lot like the microbiome of earlier generations. It's not identical. You know, antibiotics have disrupted it to a large extent, but there's a continuity in a lot of different ways. And you know, part of the continuity is that we inherit genes, but there are other there are other channels. And you know, the, we, maybe we should be thinking of the microbiome as one of these channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me, which feels like it's a good time for us to sort of come full circle here. I mean, it's, it's so fascinating. I think we're at this, a moment in time now where not only the understanding of what is the umbrella, you know, that we call hereditary, but also the ideas, the technology, the processes are expanding just the potential of our, both our ability to understand and our ability to do something about what we understand, about what we discover. I think it's it's a super exciting time. So the name of this is Good Life Project. So as we sit here, if I offer out the phrase to live a good life, what comes up? I think to live a good life is to always be curious and to be willing to recognize that you were either wrong before or just didn't know about something and to, to be always ready to move forward and update how you understand the world. Cause it's, it's much more interesting and much more complicated than you can guess at beforehand. And so, you know, that's how, when I think about living a good life, that's an important part. Mm. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Good Life Project podcast. And thanks to our absolutely fantastic and wonderful sponsors. If you love this show. If you dig the show, please support them. They help make the podcast possible. Check out the links in today's show notes to find them. And don't forget, of course, if you've been listening and saying that whole Camp GLP thing sounds amazing, it is amazing. And what's amazing about it is the people are beautiful and warm and welcoming and the activities will reintroduce play and laughter to your life and movement and mindset and growth and learning. This is a once- a year, if not once in a lifetime experience. I would love to see you there to trade some hugs and mugs. So if you've been waiting, be sure to register now to lock in the final $100 early bird discount. It expires in just a few days. And when that expires, if any spots remain, by the way, they'll be full price. Learn more at goodlifeproject.com slash camp. See you next week.